welcome to Playing With Fire, the podcast for people who are ready to custom build their love. We're talking about non-monogamy, however you design it, as an individuation opportunity. Want to leave the default and make your life spectacularly you? You're in the right place. Hello, Jessica. Thank you so much for joining us today. I, I'm really excited and I'm saying us because Ken knows that I'm doing this interview with you and he's ready to listen to it, but he decided to step out of the conversation because he's like, no way. I, you, the two of you take the floor, ask all the questions, have the conversation. He's going to listen to it afterwards and have a lovely intro conversation with me. So people will be hearing what Ken and I think leading up to this and he was very excited to hear what you want to talk about today. So thank you for joining us. I really, really appreciate it. We're going to talk about criticism. Yes. I, you can imagine why Ken was excited. <laughs> I mean, I, the reason I was excited about this topic is because I, as a strong woman, I definitely identify somebody as somebody who has dealt with being a little too fluent in criticism. Fluent, we'll call it that. Yeah, fervent. <laughs> so I would just love for you to start us off by telling us why you talk about criticism. And mm. what, like, it's a pretty tough subject to spend your time talking about. It is and can be very tough. And I like what you're saying that it can be very common, especially when we look at dynamics where one partner is a little more assertive or feels very comfortable occupying space and asserting their preferences or even giving unsolicited feedback, which can sound critical. And yet one instant isn't gonna be a game changer necessarily, but when we look at the arc of a period of time or even the life of a relationship, this can start to whittle away and to be honest, that like creates some damage in the bond and the connectedness. Cause let's just back up. I come from a framework. I reference a lot of different researchers and psychologists and, and my couple's approach. And one of the ones that I'm heavily referencing is the emotional focus therapy. And that's looking at the significance of the attachment system and the need to feel a sense of safety in the connectedness. And that we're essentially from a nervous system standpoint, wired up to feel this sense of safe haven or safe bond or feeling like your partner has your back. So in that respect, most of the time we're bonding in this modern day society, not for survival, not for, you know, other than to yes, yeah, sexual intimacy and all of those things, but we don't need a relationship to experience sexual intimacy, right? So when we're looking at a sense of emotional bondedness within relationship, it's usually to feel a sense of being seen, a sense of feeling really loved and understood. And so when we talk about criticism and then the partner to that of defensiveness, that's the loop mm -hmm. typically is criticism, defensiveness. It's a very natural response to be defensive to one's partner giving them unsolicited criticism and rightfully so this is our partner this is the person that we care like deeply about especially when we're talking about primary relationship that that there's a lot at stake there there's a lot of significance and so and typically I'll, I'll talk more about this but typically when criticism is used it's an attempt to get attention ouch Oh I'm yeah. Po I'm pointing to the thing that hurts. Can't you see? And yet that pointing is pointing at your partner. And then that description, that characterization is like, whoa, that's not the whole picture. That's not the whole story. Let me counteract that and level this out. But then that distracts to the criticism defensiveness. And then that's on a whole different train track than the original intention, which is like, I'm hurting I'm waving my hand here. I'm giving you a signal that I'm hoping you'll turn towards, but that deeper reveal, that's not the thing that gets attended to. It's, it's on this other track of like, I'm defending my character here. Right. That's not the whole picture. You're not seeing my side of things. Let's make this fair. I really appreciate you immediately helping me see this through the lens sort of of an equation almost like, well, what happens? This is a, it's like a call and response I'm hearing that people fall into. And I'm guessing that you see this, I'm guessing, well, 
when I put on my jealousy glasses, right, I, I can just easily pop them on because that's what I talk about all the time. And I can see jealousy everywhere. I'm guessing that that's how criticism feels for you, that you can see it in very subtle ways as well as those really obvious ways. So let's take a moment and just define criticism. Like, what is it really? And what does it yes. maybe look like? What do we hear when we're receiving criticism? Yeah. Well, I would say less about a research formulated kind of definition. I would say it's talking about the other mm -hmm. and giving unsolicited feedback that's typically meant to be corrective or, <laughs> yeah. or it can yeah. be even a little bit more on the spectrum could be a little bit more name calling. You should, you didn't, which can sound like to the other person, you're not good enough or kind of that quality of almost disciplining, right? If you imagine a pet that you're trying to discipline in a little bit more of a firm approach and you're like that punishing, like I'm going to rub your nose in it type of thing, which I don't recommend for a pet even, but, yeah. but that that's the, and look, this comes from these tendencies of being critical, have a backdrop to it. I don't think anybody sets out consciously to like, I'm going to criticize my significant other, my partner. And that's the best Avenue. I don't think that that's the process. It's usually I'm hurting. There's something underneath that I'm uncomfortable about. And this is my best attempt. And I can talk about the reasons why that developed, but what it looks like is usually a pointing the finger to the other, describing the other, perhaps in the attempt to get change through the means of giving feedback, correction, Advice. and criticism. It, it's yeah. critique, really, right? Mm -hmm. And then sometimes it can take more extreme forms that are name calling, and it can be a little bit more aggressive and hurtful and damaging in that regard. Yeah. Okay. This is helpful to me because immediately what comes to mind is the fact that most of us, yeah, like you said, don't, we, we're not showing up meaning to, but the thing is, I'm guessing most of us don't even really fully admit how much criticism we offer in relationship, especially those of us who grew up with it. So if you, yes. I grew up in an incredibly criticism forward household, um, that was, that was the norm. So I recognize it in myself in part because of all the unpacking I've done from my childhood and like, oh, oh. And if I look back at my grandparents, like, oh, and there's the thread, right? So it's easy to at least see why it may, it has internal consistency. It makes sense that this is where it went. So cool. And since we know that this is damaging, especially over the long term. I mean, I don't want to say, what do we do? Because that's obviously like, <laughs> it's too, it's too simplistic a question, but how about this? How much criticism is too much, <laughs> right? Like, well, mm -hmm. Because at some point there must be a threshold. And I'm thinking about Gottman's research with like yes. the ratio of positive yes. to negative. Is that yes. where we'd be heading to look at this? Actually, I would have a real direct response to what do we do? I can't answer that oh, question. And awesome. I would love to even back up. So I feel there's three questions on the table. And if I can slow down and just address your first comment of recognizing inside yourself, having come from an environment where criticism was the norm or perhaps was utilized. And I want to even round that out that there are many families that are very high functioning, high achieving intellectual. And I will even add here, raise my hand included, but even in my clients who are in all genuineness, meaning to articulate their experience, but it's this description and it's not the description of the other. Description rather of the than, other. rather than speaking from like a place of yes. this is what I'm feeling, this yeah. is what I'm experiencing. Instead, criticism looks like your description of the other, your assessment of them like that. I would even say the description of the dynamic, like it's almost this, I'm analyzing what's happening here. And that can enter into the territory because it's this almost like, I'm thinking about it. I'm analyzing it and I have judgments about it, that judgment and criticism. And so 
The other thing I want to say, just as far as the norm of this is I do believe it's heavily reinforced in more modern Western culture because we get a lot of accolades from achieving, from controlling, from intellectualizing, from analyzing. Like these are all things that are heavily rewarded. And that's in certain venues. When we look at the relational space, I don't, this is like two big points I want to make that about why it gets problematic is in relationship, I don't know anyone that responds well to the unsolicited corrective feedback, right? We're not, you know, I've been through the, so have you been through the PhD dissertation process, you're signing up. Or if you sign up for a program, whatever you sign up, you're being evaluated. You're going to be critiqued. You're, you're implicitly, explicitly saying yes to getting criticism. Yeah. And yeah. we do this in the work world. And anytime we're training, we're getting that coaching, that feedback. So there's a lot of realms where this is constructive, but in relationship. And it's consensual. And it's consensual. Yes. Yeah. And then the other thing that uh, criticism is really I think um, I'm looking at my notes because it's, I want to make sure that I get it right. That, yeah, I think I already kind of mentioned this, that it gets us off track, right? So criticism yeah. doesn't bring more reveal to the thing that really is the heart of it, which in my book, and you were kind of starting to point to this with using I statements is in relationship that we want to, as I mentioned before, typically want to feel understood, seen, and when couples or partners or however many people we're talking about can have this deeper level of understanding, that that's what cultivates the sense of bondedness, connection, and that's why we typically enter into these, these relationships. Okay. So criticism isn't in service of that. It's actually quite a, a diversion from that. So that's kind of the number one. Do you want to respond to that? Yeah, no, I just wanted to say that I, I agree that this makes sense to me and it feels incredibly hard to stay mindful of. Yes. It sounds like really like, cause we're talking about rewiring our, our innate, our current innate response. Right. And then also remembering that we're off track. I mean, oh, just even bringing that into it, like, oh, both of these go off down a path that lead away. It's not a turn toward moment. It's a, I'm going to offer you this corrective and then you're going to defend and now we're far apart. So, I mean, if nothing else, no matter how many people are, are in any relationship, the further apart we all wind up, the less relational we feel. So yeah. No kidding. It's a complete divide and it can feel, it can lead to distancing It can lead to disdain. It can lead to feelings of rejection. It can lead to all types of really hurt and difficult feelings. And I, just to add to this one more piece, I know we'll move on here to the second question, but I think the habit of it too, like you're saying, it can be so ingrained and such a part of our, our, our reach or just our normal go-to. And we actually get some dopamine, like the neurochemicals. It's like a little bit of a, like addictive thing. Mm -hmm. And especially when, if one feels a level of threat or fear or insecurity, it's a protest, right. Or hurt like this, we're talking about really important, significant things here. And so if I feel like somebody snubbed me or they weren't being honest, or I found out information that I was, you know, it's easy to want to like call that out. Yeah. Cause you don't feel safe. You don't don't feel feel safe. safe. Right. And you want to make, you want to try to get safety. Right. And, and and it's, so it's a turning that desire for safety out into our connection. Yes. Then I got to ask, I know we have to get to, there's so many pieces to this, but I, I work with neurosomatic intelligence for this. Like I have to turn (sighs) first to me and this does not come easily to me personally. Like, yes, I was very late to my body. Just, just Mm -hmm. arrived. I'm 46, just arrived a few years ago, really. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think you're describing a very familiar scenario for a lot of us, no matter what gender, no matter what relationship structure, a lot of us are, we're protecting our, ourselves, our, our, our parts, our inner child, however you want to label it, we're protecting from the idea that some of this is just, we don't feel safe. And it's so, I mean, I, I love attachment work, but I do get a little frustrated because it can be so tempting to ask for all of my safety to come from outside. <laughs> yeah. And it's not that it's not and, that. Right. So then I fall into this loop of, 
like I feel unsafe and now I point my finger at you and now you get defensive and now I feel okay. less safe. And yeah, so so this is where I remember because I've done a lot with um learning about uh the snarches work. I don't know if you've ever yeah. the differentiation. Oh, yeah. I, like I love that. Yeah. That's at the and, core of my work. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. So I'm a big fan and I know that he passed. So yeah, recently. Yeah. I know, I know, a couple of years ago. So regard and honor. And I remember when I was learning from the EFT world and the suits, I was tracking this. I was like, how, where is this? And the place that I found the, the real distinguishing of like how I could fully buy in was it's not about the dependency of, I need you to make it better for me. The work is really can with the assistance of a practitioner or therapist, it's when one person's accessing those deeper layers and the vulnerability, it's getting stability and <clears throat> excuse me, it's getting stability in their, their position and they're getting their balance on their own two feet. That is giving them contact with themselves and their experience and the deep vulnerability that might relate to attachment needs. It might relate to insecurities. It might relate to traumas that relational traumas, past traumas, and it's being willing to connect with that. Yeah. Then as it relates to relationship, it's send a clear signal. So it's not like I need you to do something to make me feel better, but is if I can send you a clear signal and a reveal, it's like, sh I'm going to show you my belly, yeah. but I'm holding myself. I'm holding this is true for me. I mean, even the act of just revealing and speaking into, even without somebody responding for a lot of people, it can be like, wow, it just feels so relieving and so refreshing to just state what's really real without even knowing what they're going to say in reply. Yeah. But yeah. then typically what happens if there's not a lot of history and blocks that complicate this is the person in relationship or persons feels as though I see you. I know now the pressure's not on me to be the X, Y, and Z, but I see you and I see you holding yourself, standing in your position. And now I feel safer to turn towards you. And I, and I want to help typically yeah. in ways that I can help, but I am not responsible. That's, that's it. That's the key for me. I mean, because I'm frequently working with people who are, are non-monogamous or working toward healthy non-monogamy practices. This is really important because every, every new act can feel like, oh, I'm not supposed to ask my partner to take care of me, which I mean, like, yes and no, it's, it's, it's sort of a misunderstanding of the core of what we're talking about at, of in attachment. We do want our partner to be able to hold safe sp space for us, hold some, be some, considerate, be considerate, be nice, show up for us. And at the same time, Actually, and this is something I, I talk about with Ken all the time on, on Playing With Fire is that I need to trust that he will set his boundaries and that when I'm vulnerable and I'm falling apart and therefore may get really critical, which I, I am available to be called in on that. But in that moment, I need to know that he'll set his boundaries because then I might flail around like a toddler for a few minutes first mm -hmm. before I get a hold of myself. At which point, if he's holding his boundaries, now I can trust that my vulnerability will not be met with that defensiveness, which has shortened for us anyways, it's shortened the time frame yes. so much. Like this could have, in, in fact, in my first marriage, this would go on for days. That cycle would go days, maybe weeks, and it would turn into not speaking to each other or whatever. And the practice now has it, no, now it's, it's four or five minutes. Wow. And, and this is, but this is like, this is core work for me. I mean, I, sure. when you said criticism, I'm like this, this is like right at the heart of my relational work. So here yes. I am. Hi. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, shortening the time frame so that I could flail and then be like, oh, wait, okay. I see. I, I couldn't do that until he could hold his own boundaries and not take responsibility for my feelings because then he joined me in the mess. And now mm -hmm. we're, Yeah. And now it's easy to just be batting back and forth at each other, not helping. Yeah. yeah. So first of all, I love the being called in. I love that. There's an invitation there and that the trust that you are not, <clears throat> excuse me, the trust that you're not 
battling, needing to take care of him, perhaps when you're feeling dysregulated and that if he's saying, I'm not available for this, less of like you're bad and wrong and you're doing that thing that I hate and you should be ashamed of yourself, (laughs) but more of like, um, I don't know if this is one of those places, but it feels like one of those places. And I am actually feeling myself starting to react and I am not, I don't want to do that. However, it sounds, I love that. I love that. And because what you're describing at the core and I can relate, it's, I'm sure experiences have their own nuances. And for me, I have been more in that role of caregiving or being attentive to others and helping create safety and Conversely, though, when I'm having issue or I'm hurting and I'm trying to point to the thing that hurts in the past, I would talk about it in a very intellectual way, which I think my partner would take as criticism. And to be in the place of like, here's what happens for me in a deep, vulnerable place and the emotional reveal of that can feel incredibly like a huge emotional risk. And to really be like, give myself space for that, right? That that's, that's also in this. So I, I, I'm, I think that's just pointing back to something you said earlier. Sometimes it hasn't always been safe in our early experiences to feel like we can access this deep vulnerability and express it and that we're going to be um, well-received. And again, it's not a dependent on the reception and the responsiveness, but that it's safe. Like the co-regulation of that is safe enough, right? Yeah. And that there can be some patience. Cause what I heard you just describe is grace, like a little bit of grace, because if, if everyone is expected to somehow follow the perfect pattern, now we just have a different relation, right? Like that's not yeah. actually what I'm going for. And, and I'm frequently dealing with situations where, um, it's outside. I can't just turn to any typical book and say like, how would I resolve this? What's the next move? Because I'm often dealing with like competing needs that really Mm -hmm. are different and people have to make decisions. Multiple partners does sort of increase the level of uh, vulnerability (laughs) that's going on. So I'm seeing that grace and patience is a key ingredient, just taking a beat, taking a taking that time. So I'm guessing that's important in this process of dealing with criticism from both sides. Yes, 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 yes. And I think that's one of the thing I really appreciate about the non-monogamy community is there's, I would add just my sense of it is that there's a level of discernment that things are not already smoothly paved and identified. Like there's new language that's needing to get developed and we're needing to discern between is this what I'm feeling or is that what I'm feeling? And it doesn't fit into perhaps conventional terms. And so that's a lot of uncharted territory that requires a level of slowing down and attuning into and discernment between. And sometimes it's uncharted and it can be uncertain. Right. And so we, that need for differentiation, right? Like if I need to know that I am separate from you in a, a, in a two person dyad relationship, That only becomes more important if there are multiple people involved, no matter what the structure of that is. And this actually, I have a lot of children and this comes up there too. If I don't remember that each of my relationships is distinct and that I show up differently in each of those, because we have this fallacy Mm. of being a unified whole. (laughs) I treat them all the same. Yeah. So yeah. And, but in fact, we all have different relationships. I show up differently and I can think of the differences easily with my children. Like, yep, I I show up more with more critique for some than others. And shockingly, it might be the ones who are least like me that I have the most critiques of. Hmm. And this, I see this in partnerships all the time. So really what I'm, I'm noticing is that I see this constantly, but Mm -hmm. it's not a word I have used. So you've now just handed me something that's really, really important. It's the word like, is what's happening in the room criticism. Can we Mm -hmm. identify that there's critique going on because if I can, now I could move away from that by being strategic, by being thoughtful. Like I, I, we have to apply actual skills to this and yes. not just hope that it magically gets better. Otherwise you wouldn't be here talking to us. Right. Okay. So let's turn towards that. And I do think there's a time and a place and I, particularly when things are stable, sometimes partners will solicit feedback 
That's a very yeah. different thing. There are consensual. many times that. <laughs> consensual, consensual, consensual. And there are many times in my relationship where I will be compelled to offer feedback. And it's not even that I'm like hurting and I'm wanting to point to this thing. It's more just like, I'm excited and I'm passionate and I want to offer, you know, whatever my perspective is. And sometimes my partner's receptive and sometimes he's not. So I really want, that's the consent part. And so I think there can be times and places where the feedback and, and constructive, even criticism or critique can be helpful or wa warranted or safe. I mean, we, I work in a business with a partner. So, I mean, constructive right. criticism has to have containers. We make containers for that. Yes. Like we do after action reviews, we do <laughs> analyses in the container. Cause otherwise, yeah, it's just unhelpful. Right. Critique. Right. Yeah. People's yeah. hackles and all the <laughs> I mean, it's just all yeah. right there so quickly. Okay. So let's turn towards the practicate the prop excuse me the practical application of this you had asked the question about the Gottman and the research that comes or the recommendations that come out of their research and I've heard five to one I've also heard during conflict it's actually 20 to one right that we really want to be mindful of how the, the how we're presenting and the the picture that we're presenting I do think in the health of a bigger you know this the bigger scope of relationship that's very helpful, particularly if we bring in, I don't know if you buy into the love languages. I do think some of the categories have merit that. Yeah. Right, they're like just, limited it, in functionality, but they, but they do describe a thing. Yeah. Right. And so the, if somebody is very much words of appreciation, like those type of things can be really helpful. Cause I think the criticism can hurt more for someone that that's their top love language. Yeah. Okay. So, so I do think that there's some cog being cognizant of the attention and the focus and what's getting a lot of airtime in the relationship. And I think that they're speaking about what's the, the sentiment, what's the kind of general environment or the climate of your relationship. So I do think that that's important, but staying more specifically to criticism and what do we do about that to your second question, I would say in practice, really recognizing, slowing things down when the tendency is to point or to get attention and is I would just say two things here in a real like distilled way. One of the things I do is I ask, okay, what's my need or do I have a request here? Because sometimes there's actually a request, but I'm not being very clear not about saying it. that. <laughs> I'm just like, you left me. You always leave your, my husband does this thing. Um, and I have a guide and I reference this in the guide, but he'll like, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting thing. He'll literally leave his shoes in the doorway, like whether or not it's like he just stepped out of them. Yes. Like, and I'll open the door and they're like, I, if I'm not looking, like, I feel a little like worried that I'm going to trip over them or, you know, now it's kind of funny and it's not a really on the scale. It's not a huge issue, but it's, an, it was been an annoyance. And I was like, why does this have charge for me? And I was like, oh yeah, if I am caring and I'm not paying attention, I could easily trip or it doesn't feel like he's considering my ease of walking trip hazard free in the walkway. Yep. Right. And so instead of just being like, you always leave your shoes. Like, why do you do that? You know, and that it could be done even a playful way. And, and honestly, in all kind of fairness in, in real, uh, secure relationships, things like this can be tolerated, but when there's yeah. a lot of bumps and injuries and like, this can be enough to be a trip wire to kind of spin things. So if I can turn that, is there, is there something in this for me that I can, I'm actually asking for, is there a request here? Cause that, that actually helps him see, and I'm more visible about what I, what I'm needing. And if I can even give him the backdrop, Yeah. right. I am happy to share more stories. I know we don't have a ton of time and really personalize this. Uh, but if I can give him like, here's where I go, here's what it reminded me of. Or, this is my history. This is why it matters to me. And that's kind of that getting my stability, showing the root, like my belly, helping him see, it's not like you need to, it's, would you be willing? And here's the information around that. Yeah. Yeah. And then similarly, when we look at what do we do with criticism? How do we almost reverse engineer this is when we are hurting or I'll just personalize this when I am hurting, like, so we're, we're, as I mentioned to you, we're currently displaced. So we're up in the Pacific Northwest right now, but we have lived for the last eight plus years in Santa Barbara, California. And we both play a lot of beach volleyball. I typically play women's the height 
of the women's net is lower and then the men's net and then co-ed is played on the, men, the men's net. And uh, it's a classic thing that couples have <laughs> playing together because they, all the little nonverbals and, and uh, the heterosexuality they, is not always a great choice. And it sounds like <laughs> beach volleyball is one of those places. <laughs> <laughs> Precisely. <laughs> Precisely. Yes. Cause there's a lot of things that get fueled in that. Even when you add the patriarchal sports, like the, the background, and how they play the game like, and yeah, competition and dominance. And I got something to prove and like, okay. yes, there's a lot that we could philosophize around that too. Uh, but coming back just to like, he might display things and what looks like anger to me. And then I'm getting smaller and I'm feeling less like I'm able to play. And he, and anyway, the dynamic of it. And I can easily be like, you're being such a jerk or like, what's your problem? Or, you know, really be upset. And that's legitimate. That's just one level. And yeah. if I take it to like my journal and I like, I literally, the Julia, like the first, however much is going to be like, the rant, the, the vent and the, this, and that is important for me to kind of tell the story and get it out and all the things I feel. Cause it's really like, I need somebody, you know, sometimes in the couples work, people who haven't done a lot of it, they'll come in and they're like, want me to be the judge and they want to plead their case, <laughs> lay it all out. Here's my evidence. And it's tons of legitimizing. And, you know, and there is a place of feeling that that's valid and, and makes sense and it's understandable. And then there's the deeper layers right? When I can get to those deeper layers, well, what would that allow me to feel? If he didn't display frustration and anger in that way, what would it allow me to feel? Like, what is it that I'm needing? And like, oh, I feel embarrassed or I actually don't feel safe emotionally. Like I'm afraid he's going to get upset with me or I feel myself, I don't feel as free to kind of play my game. And so like, I feel scared. I feel uncomfortable. Like that probably was more in the ballpark of what I was feeling. And if I can connect with that and again, what is that? What, yeah. what do I know about that? What's the history? Like all the understanding around that. So I'm kind of like shortchanging this for the sake of time. So I'll just try to slow down. But if I can share with him that, as you might ima imagine, it would be a very different dynamic than like, what's your problem? Why did you do, why'd you kick the ball? Or why did you say X, Y, and Z and really get on him Yeah. versus for me to say, look, like, here's what happens for me when it looks like this on the outside. I don't know what's happening for you on the inside, but on the outside, that's what it looks like. And here's what happens for me. Yeah. And maybe I do set some boundaries. Maybe we don't play together. Maybe I'm not comfortable. Like that's a real thing too. And for the relational space of, you know, if it's about things that we share space with and don't necessarily have as easy of an option to bow out to, yeah. right. Then, then we do have the intention of working together and resolving that and trying to co-create. So I'll pause there. No, I love that. Let's talk about that co-creation though, because I heard you say, so the two things are, I, if you can identify that you have an unspoken request, I am all about that because everyone who comes through my work is by the very nature of it, there will be unspoken requests because you're you're you've decided to transition from monogamy to more more what who knows but in there are a whole bunch of unspoken desires wants needs even if they're just for an experiment right so identifying those is so powerful anyways but in this particular instance the unspoken request might be incredibly tiny and might feel I can imagine many people not understanding that it's a request because it feels so obvious to them that there's a right way for this thing to be done. Yes. So why if you would surveyed, I a request? Yes. Right. If you surveyed all the people in the world, everybody would say you don't do that. Right. And right. so why would I ever have to actually say this? And I get a lot of resistance um, from people in my practice where people are, I don't want to have to ask this. And yes. sometimes people will actually say this, like, I should not have to ask this. And almost always, if I'm watching them on Zoom or they're sitting in my office, they're pointing their finger at that moment. I don't want to have to ask that. Like, you can feel all yeah. of the tension. Yeah. And they're, I can't help but see in there this deep desire to be seen and known for some innate qualities, for some like core self that just makes them obvious so so easy to read they just want to be known without having to muddle through their own mess inside and I definitely feel that why do I have to comb this all out can't you just see what it is I need 
So that's a problem. (laughs) Yes. Yes. And I would add, I have also in, in dynamics like that heard, if I have to ask for it, I'm afraid it won't be genuine. Yep. Or it won't be real. Yep. Or it won't, I'll be like spoon feeding. Right. And, and I don't know about you, but I always, when my kids were little, one of my pro moves was to feed my children the words that I needed them to say in order to get them to do some really basic pro social behaviors, like say thank you after they were handed something. And I would just ask them. And if they didn't, weren't able to do that spontaneously, I would say, do you want a do over? They could volunteer for a do over and I would tell them, I would just give them that language and it never felt bad. And then we did the thing. And for me, the, the transformative moment in applying this in my adult life was realizing that it was, it's not actually parenting. It's helping somebody with a weak spot. It's, it felt similar to having to parent someone or having to take care of them, but feeding them a line is in, like giving them the instruction guide to how you work not a bad move. Like I, I don't, but I can see that, that genuineness problem. Like I need it to spring just forth from them. I need it to naturally happen. We want so much to be natural in relationships. And I don't know about you, but my work seems to have made clear that a lot is not natural. In relationships. No. And I think oftentimes we're choosing partners where they exhibit qualities that are undeveloped in the other, yeah. or perhaps where attracted to certain dynamics based on things that we've had traumas around or pain or wounding around. And so there's a, there's oftentimes a fit yeah. that will be activating. And Mary and, somebody will bring us our, our stuff, right? Yes, and, yes, exactly. And I can say too, that I continue to know a depth. And I mean, my husband and I have been together for like 17 years and I'm still completely odd <laughs> by what I learned and the, the meaning and my understanding around it, it's just as deep, like, wow. Okay. Yeah. Right. And so the manual, and I, I think that's so important if we actually can help, I mean, that's really what it is about being seen and loved and, and really regarded Yeah, is when we can help somebody understand. Right. 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 And so, and if we're giving example around, this is my request, or this is what I'm really seeking. And I would say in most of the time in adult relationships, people don't just say things. I mean, yes, there's the whole, when we talk about patriarchal and like old, old conventionally, like happy wife, happy life, like, yes, 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 whatever. I, I do think that did exist. And I'm, I'm not speaking about that, but I would say the average person is not just going to lip service for no reason. Like most people are going to try to find a way to make it their own or have some level of alignment with it. And then just to be in the experiment of, like you mentioned, of even uh, trying something on, even though it's not habituated or not developed yet as a manner, but to have the practice of it, to actually get to be in service of the result of showing up or helping or offering something to some, to your person who it matters so much. And then the like resonance of that, like the opening of that, like how satiating and like how beautiful it is to give a gift that it's really what they're wanting rather than putting all this energy into something that they don't want, right? Like we're talking about trying to dial things in that if we're going to show up for each other, why not do it in a way that's going to land? Yeah. Yeah. I I'm noticing how, how many opportunities then there are. If we're, if we're looking at all of these small moments where criticism shows up, as micro moments where we could we could decide to engage in our relational growth right in those micro moments, then like the opportunities are going to be all over the place to know each other, to be seen, which also means we're increasing our vulnerability. And yes. I like, I mean, clearly I like that or I wouldn't do this work. You like that. But I know a lot of people that come across my work are struggling. And some of them are struggling with a long history of being avoidant of almost everything. And so being vulnerable doesn't sound yummy and juicy to them. It doesn't actually, they they wouldn't necessarily have an outward request for, would you please just know me? Because in fact, they they want to feel a little bit shielded and protected and they like to be a little bit more distant than that. So in that case, what might the... What might the move be? 
them yes. for somebody who wants a little bit more space or boundary? Yes. I love that question. I would say it would be smaller moves, more bite-sized. It doesn't have to be the full emotional reveal. It could be some smaller version, slicing it thin enough to be able to offer something that's, that's in alignment with it in a way that feels like accessible, right? Because it's still in service. My, my experience with people is when, even if they're have that tendency or, or need for more space or more boundaries or more, um, yeah, just that space that allows for that sense of regulation and safety apart, like less yeah. intimate and less close that this, there's still a desire for closeness. Yes. It's just that yeah. hasn't always, their boundaries haven't always been, they've been intruded upon, they, their boundaries have been crossed, or perhaps they haven't always felt like they've been seen or that their needs mattered, or there's lots of reasons why people might develop that strategy. But I would say just to slice it thinner, like maybe even just saying, I want to tell you about what I'd like, but I'm uncomfortable. Like that's not even saying the thing that's uncomfortable. It's just saying yeah. I'm uncomfortable. Like that's at least showing up and starting to point towards, you know, or I'm feeling the, the desire to criticize. I think there might be more here for me and I need some time to think about it, or I want to yeah. process it a little bit. I don't know that I'm ready to like, I, I don't know that I have it clear yet. My husband yeah. says that all the time. He's like, I don't know. Like I, he wants to tell me, but he doesn't know. So That's he'll it. need a couple of days to get clear. And then when he is clear, he'll, he'll, he will share, but our pacing is entirely different sometimes. I see that all the time. I've had partners. So I'm, I'm married to somebody who had an avoidant history, but now actually is very much, uh, in, in team, um, I want to show you all of my everything. Um, but I've had partners who don't live with me in particular, who also have a bit more introversion going on. They also have a, a different processing speed and desire. Like it's not that they're not working, um, at this rate they want, they are, they are paced differently. And I've noticed that that's where our, our understanding of how, how it works for us becomes like this grinding gears because we're not in each other's space all day, every day to right. act like, oh, right. That's her pace. And a girlfriend once who like her pace was just much slower than mine. And I was not anticipating it one, because she was a girl and I was expecting her to be more like me. Cause yeah. You know, because I'm dumb. And, <laughs> and no, I mean, like, like I, I made all these assumptions yes. but then, and then we didn't share living space. Yes. And so I, it took, it took months and months and months for me to realize, even though she was telling me and showing me that she needed space before she could answer questions or before she could respond to even a spoken request, let alone an unspoken request. And so I needed to develop my patience so much and really start to think about what this relationship was for differently mm -hmm. because it was outside of the the day-to-day -day householding we have to get on the same page and we have all these kids and we have to do all this stuff we actually there was no there was no rush the relationship unfolded at the speed it was unfolding and it was fine and when i noticed when i asked myself and i love this question for my clients what's the relationship for when i asked myself that question i was like uh it's to have fun that's it. That was the entire purpose of that relationship. So what was the rush? All, mm -hmm. all I needed was to give her that space so that we could find our, our cadence to mm -hmm. do things. Cause the same mm -hmm. exact, the same exact process was happening. We could fall into critique and defensiveness, but we just needed to give it a lot more space. Whereas when I'd been householding with someone, it never felt like there was time to wait. So that taught me a valuable lesson. In fact, I can wait. I don't actually have to get everything when I want it. I still right. don't like that truth, but it, it remains true nonetheless. <laughs> and I would wonder too with you that even if somebody, a couple or partners are householding together, that there might be an occasion or more than an occasion where things like there's almost a pin in it and then we haven't fully <laughs> resolved it or processed it and we're still existing and and co-parenting or all the things that need to do with the householding. And we will trust that we'll get back to it. I think that's the part where people get a little stuck is like kind of forcing or needing it to happen sooner because there's this 
experience of things not being revisited or circling back to, and then thus it feels like there's a fear of it getting lost or pushed under the rug, those type of things. So, uh, yeah, I think the point of really is just finding the place of connection where people can really be in more of the reveal and be able to share and have that understanding. And sometimes even the receiver might need a little time. Like there, there, this doesn't, this isn't formulaic where it's yeah. going to like plug and play and it's just so much more nuanced, but I think that the principles are very alive. I, I really love this. And I, I, I personally appreciate so much that you are spending time in this, this particular mire. Cause it's, it's hard. I have struggled with it. I continue to struggle with it. And I, I'm excited whenever somebody is doing the work in these murky places, because I know it means that you're listening to stories like this and you're listening to this dialogue all the, all the time. And so thank you for being present to that. Cause I know it's, um, it, I know it can add up and just because you know, it's important doesn't mean that it doesn't take its toll. So yeah, just thank you for being present to it. I really appreciate that. Hmm. So I know I am 100% certain <laughs> that the people listening, many of them resonated and want to know, so what's the next step? How do we find out more about what Jessica is doing? Because we need that help or I need that help. I need to know what to do next. What should people do next? How should they be in touch with you? Well, I would say just as far as this conversation, I developed a free guide, which can be helpful. It's shifting criticism into connected communication and more or less, you know, it's the email opt-in thing. And I, I'm, I'm wondering about that strategy, by the way, I don't know that I'm going to, we should to definitely talk because everybody needs a new strategy once in a while. Right. Yeah. That's a great, I actually, I did go grab the guide right before. And I was like, oh, it's so succinct. So for, for what it's worth a good email guide right there. There's some ideas. What do I do? Okay. So it's a 22 scenarios of how to reverse engineer this, how, what a situation, what it looks like with the critical tendency, and then how to perhaps turn that into more of a revealing vulnerable statement, whether or not it's a request or here's where I'm at with this situation. And that can lead towards more connected communication. And then from there, if people stay on the list, they'll get a series of more information. I have podcasts and articles and different things I've done. And if people want to do a deeper dive, I actually have a course. It's a mini course that is research-based tips and tools, really spelling out what's all happening here around why it's so hard to change. Cause many people are just like, I got it. I'm not going to do this again and try to use willpower. And it's just, it's so insidious that it, that typically doesn't work. So having the deeper understanding and how to work with these deeper layers that, cause it's fueled by something. It's not just, it's the tendency is there. And if, yeah, if we try to stop the habit, there's utility in that, but there's a deeper thing that's needing to be, it's like, it's, it's not just going to go away. So we right. need a different outlet to give space for that. So um, that's available too. And then the podcast that I, um, and articles is yeah. on the website. So. Well, tell everybody about your podcast too, before we go, because it's, it's wonder. I mean, you have made quite the resource. That's a lot of episodes, woman. That's a lot. So Thank way you. to go. Well, you were on it and I'm so loved our interview and just want to echo what you've done around jealousy and all that you're doing with your clients and the community that you serve. And so it was just a deep honor to have you as a guest and I'm grateful we got to meet. And the show is just Empowered Relationship Podcast and the intention is to support people navigating long-term intimacy. And I try to be as inclusive as possible. I will say a lot of it is geared towards, I think a lot of people are referencing um, monogamy, but I don't think that it's exclusive. I think a lot of the principles can be universal, but just it's not targeted towards non-monogamy. So I love that you're offering people a lot to really, because it's there's so much more that to serve that endeavor, or that kind of interest that I think is unique and specific that I don't think I'm actually being doing a lot for. I'm just more about relationship that I've had people tell me like, it helps me with my kids. It helps me with my business. So it's, it's just relationship principles, yeah. but I think I use a lot of examples for long-term intimacy. With so that was actually why I was going to say, I think that 
your podcast, one of the things that stands out to me, and, and I don't always have people on Playing With Fire who are working from that monogamous perspective, but over and over again, I have found myself when I listen to an episode, like, yep, those, it applies to many of my relationships, even if it doesn't necessarily apply in my more complicated dynamics. Like some of them really do need a different set of layers on top of the base relationship skills. But I have a lot of relationships and a lot of them just need me to be mindful of the many, many approaches that are available. And that's what I really like. You, you're you looking at it from a bunch of different angles because you've interviewed so many different types of people. So I really appreciate that. And that um, that speaks to me. So thank you for creating that. I appreciate it. And thank you so much for joining me. I can't wait to have Ken listen to this one and add his feedback. I believe I'm, I believe I'm going to get some homework. <laughs> <That's what. laughs> and I, I welcome it. That's the only way we grow. So here we go. Thank you, Jessica. I really appreciate it. It's been an honor. Thank you so much.